Hi everyone, my name is Shelby and you're watching Read and Find Out. So as a heads up, I feel a little bit under the weather at the moment. Over the past few days, my site host has been kind of sick and I'm starting to feel something in my throat and I think I might be on the verge of being like a little sick, but well enough to film this video because it has been an entire month since I did my last MBTI video and I only have one left. So that is what we're going to be doing today, my perceiving book recommendations. And this is the other half of the judging versus perceiving preference. So in my last MBTI video, we talked about how this preference is really about how you deal with the external world. It's how you extrovert. So judges are more focused on their thinking or feeling preference. So they're, they're making decisions. They want structure in their decisions to be made. Perceivers, or people who have the perceiving preference, are using their sensing versus intuition preference in how they are extroverting. So they're a bit more go with the flow because that preference is about how you're taking in information. This isn't to say that perceivers aren't organized or don't need structure. It's just that they're more flexible and spontaneous in how they approach their outer life. Even if maybe inwardly they're a bit more organized or something, outwardly this is how they deal with the world. They improvise and adapt, they take things as it comes. On the ocean or big five personality traits, they would be very high on openness to experience. And the books that I recommend today are going to have some of these qualities. Standard disclaimer, if you're a perceiver and you don't like these, that's fine. You could also be a judger and like these, it's not exclusive in any way. These are just, these books have these qualities. First up, I want to talk about a classic, which was one of the first things that comes to mind when I think about the perceiving preference, and that is Alice's Adventures in Wonderland and Through the Looking Glass. I think that Alice's Adventures in Wonderland might portray the perceiving preference more, though I personally preferred Through the Looking Glass. Maybe I preferred Through the Looking Glass because it's less P. <laughs> and I'm a J. And these books are all about distorted perceptions. Like Wonderland is this kind of world that doesn't really make sense. It's a world of nonsense. And I think that perceiving, taking in information through your senses and just adapting as you go is what you kind of need for this reading experience. Because when I was spending time, at least in Alice, trying to just make sense of things instead of just going with it, I was a little frustrated at times because I was like, this is a little too over the top. I think that perceivers might be more okay and go with the nonsense of these books. I also think that these provide a very visual sort of experience. I feel like this is very easy to picture as it's happening because it's very vivid. That works well with perceiving because you're depending on that sensing versus intuition sort of preference, taking in the information. My next perceiving book recommendation is Epic Fantasy. I'm going to say a specific trilogy, though I think most of this series, overarching series, would work for this. And that is the Farseer trilogy or the Realm of the Elderlings. So I'm just saying Farseer because this is where you should start. I'm holding up Assassin's Apprentice, which is the first book in the Farseer trilogy. And I have a lot of reasons for why I think that this is perceiving that I can't exactly delve into during this video because it would be kind of spoilery. So I will just summarize. <laughs> As you're going through reading The Realm of the Elderlings, starting with the Farseer trilogy, your view of the world and the situations that are happening kind of shifts across time. It's not exactly stagnant. Entire societies are changing and adapting to different things. That goes with the politics, the general world building, which is being built across all five series in The Realm of the Elderlings. So your perceptions about different acts and different things that happen change over time. Not to mention that something about the magic system of the skill and the wit seems very perceiving to me. It doesn't feel like a judging-based magic system. Like, yes, there are some properties of it, but it's not super rigid or structured. I feel like there are never exact rules that are set down for it. And then there's also the character of Fitzchivalry Farseer, the main protagonist, at least in the Farseer books, but He's kind of the lead across the entire series, but he's featured particularly in Farseer, Tawny Man, and Fits and the Fool, which is the very final trilogy, which I have not gotten to yet because I'm halfway through Rainwild Chronicles. I think that Fitz probably views himself as purposeful and doing things for reasons and not going with the flow, but Fitz does some spontaneous things that are actually really stupid. <laughs> Sometimes Fitz just acts. And because of this, he has to adapt. He has to adapt to a lot of things just because of his life circumstances, being who he is in this society. 
being the illegitimate son of a prince but then being taken into the court anyway to kind of be hidden away in some sense as a royal assassin. And within Fitz as a character himself, you see his mind change or you see his perception shift across the series about particular issues. That is more relevant, I think, in Tawny Man because you are slapped in the face with some of the things that Fitz thinks. But it all starts here when you're building his character. If you haven't picked these up already, I highly recommend it. It's probably my favorite series. I just haven't completed the entire thing. I'm on the fourth series in the series of five series. Then we have a translated contemporary novel, which is A Man Called Uwe. And a lot of this book is about a man being forced to adapt when he is not a person who is super adaptable. Like, I would not say that Uwe is a P. I would very much so say that Uwe is a J. So I'm not recommending this because the protagonist is a perceiver, but because you are watching him as someone who is probably a judger, have to make sense of his world and change anyway. And there's also just the fact of having to be open to him as a character because he's not exactly what he seems. On the surface, he seems like this very old curmudgeonly man who might be a bit mean-spirited in ways. I think that that's probably something that Bachman does in a lot of his works, at least the two that I've read so far, Britt Marie was here and this one. They are characters who on the surface level seem like old grumps, but they have a lot more to them underneath and they are actually like nice people in ways. And I think seeing a character who's not flexible being put into a position where he has to be is something that perceivers would appreciate because they are more flexible in ways and that probably influences how they view life. Next up we have a space opera science fiction book which is The Long Way to a Small Angry Planet and this follows an entire crew of characters who are on the Wayfair. They are different species, some human, some alien, and seeing the communication between species and having to navigate how they understand each other you just had to approach it with such an open mind that I thought it was so pee. <laughs> and though I loved this a lot, I mentioned, I think in the wrap up when I read this, that it was a little bit more episodic than I would have wanted and there wasn't as much of a unifying plot, which is something I would prefer, but I think that has to do with my preference for structure and not wanting to just like go with things, but this is just showing their day to day life. And our actual lives don't always necessarily just follow this plot. I also really liked seeing characters who were challenged on how they viewed things because they were a little bit rigid in what they thought was okay or what was acceptable and pushing their own boundaries. I loved this and resonated with it in a lot of ways, if not the plot structure ways. And I think it's well worth the read, especially if you're a perceiver, because I think then you probably have the potential to love it even more than I did. And then my final recommendation is nonfiction, and it's one that I'm largely recommending because I think the style itself would work best for perceivers. And that is A Room of One's Own. This is a feminist essay by Virginia Woolf. And while I obviously think it's perceiving in the fact that it is talking about adapting with the times and that women's roles have changed and why women have been in the roles that they've been in, I also think it's perceiving because of the way that it flows Wolf's writing style is very stream of consciousness, sort of, which is something that I know I struggled with a bit, but I think that if you're someone who just goes with it, if it's something that you can just read and experience, if this style makes sense to you, then I think that you would get a lot from this. Her writing is very original, and I think that if you are okay with that kind of almost spontaneity in the writing, then this would be a great fit for you. I speak as if I didn't like it. I did enjoy this. It's just that the style didn't suit me as a person. However, I'm talking about a preference that is not my own preference. But anyway, these were my perceiving book recommendations and that is my last MBTI video. I've covered all eight preferences now. A final disclaimer about the MBTI, these are all preferences, so there's kind of like a scale. Some people fall in the middle, so you may not have a distinct preference and that is fine. I think that that's personally one of the flaws of the MBTI is that some people are more centrist on specific issues, so pigeonholing them into one type that doesn't fit them as well because they are more in the middle, that might not be productive for them. But I also don't like pigeonholing people in general. I like personality inventories as a means of 
kind of personal development, becoming more aware of some of your own thoughts or preferences. I think the self-awareness piece can be very beneficial for people. And I'm a little bit sad to be wrapping this up because I've really enjoyed doing this series, but I do have an announcement that I'm planning another series based on another personality inventory. <laughs> And that one is actually my favorite personality assessment, and it is the Enneagram. I'm thinking about doing a video for each type. If you aren't aware that Enneagram has nine types, there's a lot of other stuff that you can get into as far as like levels of functioning and wings and tri-types and instinctual variants that makes the Enneagram a lot more complex and can help you to kind of individualize yourself within it. But I'm going to be doing a basic take on the nine Enneagram types. And in case you are wondering, I am an Enneagram type 1, which is going to be the first one that I'm going to do. One being the reformer, or the moralist. And hopefully I'll get my first video for that series up sometime in the next month. But as you probably know if you've been watching these, I'm in my practicum in my master's experience, so I am a little bit more short on time than I used to be. But it'll happen when it happens. Look at me, trying to be more perceiving. <laughs> Anyway though, that is going to be it for this video. Comment down below and let me know if you've read any of these and if you did, what you thought of them. And also, what are some books that you think have characteristics that are more on the perceiving end of the judging versus perceiving preference? Thank you for watching, hope you have a good day, and until next time, 